Let's begin with our extinction segment. Some people had some questions we're going to be addressing here. And here, let's go with the first one. The fellow says, Calhoun's experiments amount to a description, not a physical mechanism. Yeah, absolutely. He's, he's right there. We don't actually know why or which factors and pathways lead to that result. And that is also true. Um, what we need to do is look at the different um, you know, parameters uh, that can affect this experiment and study each one, you know, uh, test them out, and then reach our conclusions, you know, our theories. And he continues, as a certain phenomena in rats over condensed um, timescales doesn't exclude injections or envir environmental toxicity. Well, I don't know about injections, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of these animals have received injections, you know, for different things, and I guess we lost track of uh, what animal got what, possibly, you know, so that's one thing that we have to look into. Uh, it says uh, 92 to 94 is the key period. They introduced the uh, hepatitis B vaccine at birth and started piling on other shots. Uh, well, they had shots all the way to at least the 1950s. You know, I received my shots in school in the 60s, so I don't think they started in the 90s. Way too short for mutational load. Um, and again, the question there is whether mutations can occur from one generation to the next. The answer is yes, they can. You know, you can mutate even uh, get close to a nuclear weapon <laughs> or a source of radiation. You'll probably mutate a lot of your uh, atoms. So, uh, you know, as far as shortness is concerned, you know, we can all mutate quite uh, quickly. Uh, our cells, our uh, atoms, our, you know, molecules in, in our body change. Uh, he said, this is the kind of thing you would do to people deliberately. And yeah, the, the issue there is that, you know, um, Calhoun repeated his experiment that you see there on the right. Those were the results. Uh, mice, he did it first with rats, then he did it with mice. He did a total of at least 25 experiments. I don't know if he did any more after that. But he did 25 experiments, called them utopian universes. And uh, number 25, which is, I guess, the classical one, he allowed the mice to multiply. He started with four couples, and they were normal couples. They started building their nests uh, normally, having kids, you know. They were in paradise. And um, after a few months, as you can see there, they multiplied all the way to 2,000 mice. And eventually, the uh, place got so crowded on the one hand, and uh, also the mice became autistic and homosexual. Uh, the female mice became very aggressive. And because of that, you know, the population started dropping until it reached extinction. In fact, I think he, he did not allow, um, John Calhoun did not allow the um, mice uh, the, the experiment to, to finish because he said it was so horrible to watch that he just terminated and I guess he killed all the mice and his conclusion or his uh, his corollary was they stopped being mice and someone asked a um, question there of what, how, how uh, we know that they were autistic and again you know they, they held these mice in their hands and they they, they were dumb. They, they were not normal mice, like, you know, the mouse that runs around and hides and, you know, etc. They were just, you know, like, <laughs> dumb. <laughs> they were not very intelligent at all. And you can tell, you know, you don't need to be an expert to, to see that. But uh, to answer this fellow's question, you know, um, if you go back in time, um, we, we've had all kinds of mental and physical problems in the past. And a lot of them were due to inbreeding, which is what this fellow is criticizing. He's saying it's due to vaccines and someone up there in the uh, high places, they're doing it deliberately, etc. You know, I doubt that very much. Here, here's a couple examples, just an example, okay? Um, uh, these were a couple of conjoined twins among, not, not the first, but they came before the famous Siamese twins that... Barnum and Bailey, you know, showed in their uh, circus, right? Um, and this, this dates to the 1700s. 
you know, and um, the question is, is this due to vaccines and something like that? Uh, you would think that this is something genetic. These people were born like that, okay? And they were not even the first. Uh, in fact, the first documented ones we have today are these. Here you see them. In the village of Emmaus in Palestine, a child was born perfectly normal below the navel, but divided above it, so that it had two chests and two heads, each possessing the senses. Okay? And essentially they're describing there the uh, Siamese twins that came out and went in the year 385 to 386. Okay? And uh, so, you know, we've had uh, problems with genetic births, uh, with genetic problems, right, uh, from birth, uh, who knows how, how far back in time. And let me give you another uh, example, and that is, uh, you know, it said that the Spartans would throw uh, babies who were born wrong, you know, um, from the mountain. They would kill them because they wanted a tough race, you know. <laughs> they wanted everybody to be born normal. and. Uh, uh, obviously, these babies were not homosexual or autistic because you can't tell that when the baby is born. Now, they obviously, if, if they did this, if they really killed the babies uh, when they saw something wrong, it, it was something obvious and uh, it had to be something physical, something external that you could see right there and then. But the point here is the following. You know, a Spartan uh, and an Athenian considered each other uh, foreigners, you know, Corinthians, Ar Argos, and all these little city-states, each one was considered a different country. They all spoke the same language, they prayed to the same gods, they probably had some different accents, right? But the point here is that they considered them each other foreigners. You know, you, you, were, uh, you were not of their um, city-state. The country was a city-state. And what's the issue? The issue is that, you know, people within the city-state would marry people within the city-state. They would not marry foreigners. An Athenian would not marry a Spartan or a Corinthian or whoever. Uh, so, so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, these were relatively small villages uh, trying to become cities or towns, right? And they inbred. They uh, generation after generation, especially the rich people. You know, they, they had a girl, the other guy had a guy, and so they got them together because they would kind of unite the uh, wealth of the two families. And they did this quite a bit over time, and, you know, what do you think would happen after several generations? Well, you have inbreeding, and we know what happens with, from inbreeding uh, because we see it with the Amish, we see it also uh, some of the kings I talked about in the past, uh, Charles II of Spain, uh, Alexei, the son of Nikolai II, the last um, Tsar, you know, they were born with uh, defects. Why? Because they came from families that inbred. Okay? In fact, uh, uh, both uh, Nikki and uh, Alex, uh, they, they were both grandsons, uh, grandson and granddaughter and grand. Uh, uh, kids from Queen Victoria and yeah when you inbreed well you get bad children and that's got nothing to do with vaccines or anything like that it's got to do with inbreeding and what does that affect well that has to affect your genes you know so I think it's got to do uh, all this uh, stuff that happened to the mice has to do with inbreeding primarily with inbreeding. But again, he's right. Uh, unless we run a test for each parameter, uh, we won't really and, and check them out, which is John Calhoun did not do that. Um, I, I'm not sure if he was aware that he was had a, um, uh, you know, a, a, an original colony uh, with just four mice, uh, four couples of mice that uh, who knows where they came from? You know, did he check any of that? He, he, he didn't check uh, the source of these mice. He just said, hey, give me four couples. He put them in there and he says, uh, let's see what happens. Why? Because he, he was a psychologist and he was interested in uh, finding out what crowdedness, you know, a density did to uh, the, the animals, these animals, these mice, um, to their brains. 
that's what he was studying. So he, he didn't check, you know, uh, Father, uh, what is it, the, um, uh, well, uh, when you colonize for the first time, you know, he didn't check um, uh, this, this uh, uh, oh, what's the term, <laughs> escaped my mind, um, when, when you create a, a colony for the first time. He didn't check any of that because he was studying something else, okay? And so, yeah, whoever does the experiment would have, again, would have to look at these parameters and find out, you know, uh, which ones have what effects and so on. So I don't think that's ever been done yet, as far as I know. Okay, another fellow uh, raises another issue, and he says, have you heard of Douglas Social Credit? Uh-huh. The point was to make finance mirror the physical economy so goods keep flowing and periodic financial collapse, among other things, might be remedied. Uh-huh. Periodic collapse is a feature of the financial system, not a flaw. But is it a necessity? Uh-huh. And I look up uh, this Douglas Social Credit, it says, uh, Douglas attributed economic downturns to discrepancies between the cost of goods and the compensation of the workers who made them. Okay, so this is our starting point. And um, yeah, I kind of uh, agree with him. In fact, that's what my theory in general is. It's that uh, we're going to have an economic collapse and this gives you an idea why you know what's happening is we're losing real wages over time and here's a couple of statistics okay here you see employee wages versus net productivity since 48 all the way to 2017 and what you can see there is that productivity meaning you know how much money really the uh, big corporations and the rich people make compared to uh, the wages of the, uh, of, of the workers, right? And one is outstripping the other. And you'll see several um, uh, graphs similar to these. Uh, here's another one. Okay, this is for the United Kingdom. Okay, and you can see real wages. United Kingdom has been dropping since 1964. Okay, so, you know, the workers are losing their, uh, the value of their labor. And here's another one, just in case, okay, final one here, uh, if I can get it here. Uh, labor share of income, okay, and you can see how that's been dropping at least in the last so, uh, 50 years or so, okay. And, yeah, what's happening, or the way I look at it, is that uh, we are uh, the workers, the proletariat, the person who depends on a salary, on wages, is losing the value, the real value of their wages over time. And you cannot continue doing that forever. Okay? And I think what's going to happen at some point in time, uh, people will just earn enough money to make it till the end of the month. And that's going to have a couple of impacts. One will be that corporations will not be able to sell anything extra because there will be no disposable income. People will just be able to pay the rent, eat, and that's it. And then, you know, live one more day. That's about it. Day to day. That's how they'll live. That's one issue. Another one is that they're going to have to lower the minimum wage to the point where, you know, the, the middle class will be approaching those same, uh, in other words, they, they will not increase the salaries too much of the middle uh, class. And the people in the poor levels will slowly catch up to them. And so we're going to end up with this world where you're either rich or you're poor, you know, nothing in between. And uh, maybe not that drastic, but I think we're working towards that type of world. You know, and again, it's called, uh, what, um, the rich get richer and the poor get poor, <laughs> more or less like that. And you can't continue that forever. And the question is, what's going to change that? You know, especially in this world of uh, services that we have today, I'm not sure we can change that at all. So we're headed in that direction, and I don't think there's any way to stop the train from falling off the tracks or over the cliff, right? Okay, but uh, here's a, an issue I'd like to talk a little bit about, and, and this fellow raised it uh, here. He says says, why do you think the interviewed agents are lying about the U.S. recovering alien spaceships and biology? Uh, lately, there's been talk about, you know, a fellow who 
blew the whistle on the government saying, hey, you know, they, they really collected some extraterrestrial stuff and they're keeping tight lips about it. You know, it's a secret. And uh, he just came out uh, and saying, look, I know that they've got stuff there that came from extraterrestrial sources and they just don't want the public to know about it. Maybe because they, could, I guess they fear, supposedly, right, that people will... Uh, go into some kind of panic mode, you know? And um, so he says, uh, you know, why do you think uh, he's lying? Um, I'm not gonna say that they're lying. Uh, they, they probably believe that, uh, strongly believe that, you know, in fact, they have uh, recovered something out there. And for some reason, he believes that it's extraterrestrial uh, source and the government maybe uh, is uh, considering that as a possibility as well. People who do uh, investigation, research, etc. Um, and so it's not a question of lying. It's a question that they probably do actually believe that these are from extraterrestrial sources. And all I can tell you is it never happened and never will. Okay. And so let, let's let's look at this in a little more detail. Okay, I've never done that to uh, to great satisfaction. So let, let me go over this a little bit. It's known as uh, Fermi's paradox. Okay, what is Fermi's paradox? Well, we can synthesize it uh, by synthesize it by saying, why haven't they, you know, the extraterrestrials, contacted us? That's what it's all about. Why haven't they contacted us? I mean, if, if there are civilizations out there, you would think that there are some civilizations that are more advanced than ours. You know, maybe they, they're 1,000, 2,000, maybe 10,000, 100,000, maybe a million years ahead of us. Man, they have to have all this fancy technology with which not only they can come here, but they can uh, study us, they can conquer us, you know, they can do a lot of stuff. And so Fermi was saying, well, if that's true, if there are millions of other civilizations out there, you know, why haven't they contacted us? Is it that we're too far away? Is it that they haven't seen us? Uh, what's the issue? You know, and you, you can have a lot of theories or assumptions about that. And so let's go over this and let me show you that it's impossible. <laughs> this is the issue. Okay. And so the first thing we have to look at is that uh, civilization uh, has to flourish and it's got to be more or less like us okay it can't be a tiger it can't be an eagle it can't be a fish it's got to be a monkey you know intelligence of our level right descends from the trees okay so um, you know uh, you you, you got to create something like us in other in order to be able to do something like you know Fermi's proposing here you know a uh, civilization that goes out of the planet and starts conquering you know the stars the galaxies etc and eventually reaches a planet like ours so the first thing it's got to be you know uh, a, a human like person okay and it can't be anything else it can't be an alligator it can't be you know a tiger uh, a lion or a fish or a bird it's got to be something like us. It's got to be a monkey. Okay, that's the that's the first issue. And um, but in order for life to develop, you got to have a sun-like star. Okay, and also an Earth-like planet. For this, you got to look at what is known as the um, um, uh, you know the uh, habitable uh, parameters uh, that a sun has to have or an Earth has to have in order. For there to, uh, for life to develop and for intelligence to develop within life, okay? intelligence of our. When I say intelligence, then usually I'll refer to intelligence of our level. And uh, the nearest star is uh, Alpha Centauri. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, it's Proxima Centauri. It's the Centauri system, and it's a three-star system. It looks more or less like this in the night sky. You have Proxima, which is the little uh, circle there, and that's the one that's closest to us. The other two are a little farther away, but it's a three-star system. And, you know, just imagine if you uh, are living in a planet that has life over there, like 
like the Earth at least, or similar to the Earth. Imagine a planet and you wake up in the morning and you see this, three, three suns. <laughs> Okay, you wake up and uh, there's Alpha, Beta, and uh, Proxima, which is the closest one to us. Okay, uh, it, it, you know, uh, the question is, if you have three stars like that, three suns, and, and they don't have to be all three in the morning, like, you know, you're going to have all, uh, throughout the day, you can have suns, one in the east, one in the west, one, one in the south, whatever, right? You wake up and you have all these suns around you, so you never have uh, nighttime, it's always daytime. Right? Well, those would be different conditions than what we have here on Earth. Okay, so that's one of the issues you got to look at. But uh, here are other uh, habitable uh, zones, uh, parameters that you have to consider for the habitable zone within the galaxy. Okay, and here it is. Let me put this up here. Give me a second. And uh, these are certain parameters that you got to look at. If we're too far away from the sun uh, or too close, uh, probably life would not have developed here on Earth. Okay, no kind of life. We it would have been either too hot or too cold. Maybe if we're uh, above or below the ecliptic, you know, like the uh, red uh, planets there, you know, shown. One could be above, one could be below the ecliptic. Maybe that has some effect. But I think the main ones are, you know, the mass density of the planet. Uh, it could be bigger or it could be smaller, right? And that, that would create different gravity, okay? So, uh, and you have the magnetic field, also the tilt, like, you know, if, you, uh, if the uh, Earth rolled around or spun around its equator, it would have been different, right? So the direction in which a planet spins would have an effect. Uh, what kind of atmosphere it has, you know, does it have carbon, water, uh, nitrogen, etc., you know, uh, things that we typically associate with life, um, volcanic activity, and so on. So you got to look at all these parameters, and you know, it's like um, a Goldilocks issue. It's got to be just right, or more or less right. It's got to be within certain limits. Uh, you have uh, control limits and reject limits. And within control limits, you would have some kind of life. And the question is whether intelligence of our level, of human level intelligence, of consciousness, would develop in the extremes of these control limits. You know, if you go too far in one direction, too far in the other direction, you may not get, you know, intelligence of our level. You would just get maybe animals, maybe plants, uh, but nothing very sophisticated. And so that's something you got to consider. You know, how far away can a planet be from the sun? How, how big, how small, etc. You know, uh, magnetic field, tilt. You got to look at all those things. Okay, um, one of the questions people say, well, what is intelligence? I mean, you know, uh, do, do all animals, do, do plants have intelligence? And I'm saying they all do. Okay, uh, why? Because the cell has intelligence. Okay, life is a synonym of intelligence in that sense, in the sense that when the cell developed, okay, it was already, uh, you can call that intelligence. That could be the definition of intelligence. Why? Because it was compartmentalized. Okay, you can see that the cell, whether it's plant or animal, it's got all these compartments. And it, we're not talking about just um, you know, molecules, you have more than molecules, you have compartments and each one has a function and it's like they're, they're all coordinated, you know, it's like a CPU, right? And so in that sense, you can say that uh, plants and animals have intelligence, both, uh, at that level. Of course, you know, people say, well, you know, people, when, when they talk about intelligence, they usually talk about human intelligence. And they say, well, animals don't have intelligence. You know, they do, but we got to define the word intelligence, which is a very difficult word to define, okay? Because what do you mean by intelligence? And you say, well, you know, we have humans because they have intelligence and animals which don't have intelligence. That's why people think that humans are not animals, you know, because our highest level of intelligence. And that's more or less like saying that the cheetah is not, an animal because he's the fastest runner, or an elephant's not the uh, not an animal because he's so big, 
or a whale is so big, you know. So, you know, there, there's kings in each category. There's gold medalists in each category. And we get the gold medal for intelligence, okay? Obviously, that's, that's our power, right? Intelligence. But, you know, uh, Mother Nature gave us intelligence, but that wasn't for free. You know, there, there, there was a, uh, an exchange there. Uh, you had to give something up. And what we gave up is what I call the Achilles curse or blessing, depending on your point of view. Okay, and here it is, uh, good old Achilles, if we can get him up here. Uh, uh, you either have a long, uneventful life, or you have a very short life with glory. You know, and Achilles chose the short life with glory. And he got that air in his ankle there. <laughs> Achilles heel, right? And um, and he died because of that. He died young. He, but he died with glory because, you know, he's even remembered to these days. Okay, so uh, what is that about? Well, it's uh, Mother Nature says, okay, we're going to give you intelligence because, you know, uh, she, she gave all these blessings to all the other animals. He said, the cheetah runs so fast. Uh, the elephant has might, you know, and uh, the eagle can fly. What superpowers do I give this poor little monkey? <laughs> Humans, you know, what do we give them? And so she felt pity on us and so says, I'm going to give them intelligence. And so we developed, you know, hand-eye coordination, that kind of thing, uh, and developed our brains and became the rulers of the planet. Okay, But what does that do? It, it accelerates our extinction, our tra trek towards extinction. Uh, we become extinct faster in great measure because uh, we are able to multiply. We are able to do many things, among them discover you know, some of the bugs that kill, the, kill us. And because of that, we take countermeasures. We, we realize what they do and how to neutralize them, or at least try to. Because of that, uh, we reach our um, level of, uh, of immunity a lot faster than other animals. Other animals take a long time because they do it through a natural process. We do it through, with the help of a lot of artificial stuff. We also uh, realize we have to sleep uh, better and, uh, you know, keep the place clean. We're aware of all these things. You know, other animals, you look at chickens, they're, they're birds in general, doves, you know, pigeons. They're the, the dirtiest animals you can imagine. You know, they just, shit everywhere <laughs> and they, they walk in that and you know and they live in that environment uh, whenever like in the case of chickens you know they're in this coop and they've got all this uh manure everywhere and if you don't clean it you know disease develop that sometimes they pass on to humans you know so i think a lot of the uh diseases we got we got from the animals that we corralled uh, you know put them in in pens and uh corrals and coops, right? So, you know, um, we learned about these things eventually. And so because we learned, we were able not to die so soon at the age of five or earlier. And because of that, you know, our population multiplied, meaning that, you know, we were able to move a lot faster than other animals. But all that does makes us more efficient and efficiency takes us to our early end extinction. So Achilles um, uh, curse, blessing, could be a curse, could be a blessing. Yeah, we, we have a great life because we have this magical power to think uh, about the universe and uh, things that go around us, but that cost us uh, our long life. That was the exchange. Okay. Um, anyways, we're due for imminent extinction. And so the question is, you know, if we're due for imminent extinction, as we argue here, um, what does that tell us? It tells us that we only had a window of maybe a hundred, I'll give, I'll be very generous and say 200 years in which we work with electricity and magnetism, be able to send signals and so on. And so think about that for a moment, you know, a uh, hundred, maybe 200 years. What is that in the time of the universe you know talk about millions and billions of years and here we're talking about 100 200 years 
in which we have uh, not only the intelligence to be able to uh, capture signals and send signals, but we developed the technology only in the last 100, 200 years. And now think about that for a moment. Let's say there is a planet somewhere in uh, the Centauri system. Let's make it as close as possible, right? And it's just like the Earth. It's the same size, uh, same density, same magnetic uh, field. You know, we're, 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 we're being very generous here with our uh, assumptions, right? And uh, it's the same distance from the sun, uh, their sun could be beta, which is probably the most uh, sun-like uh, star in that system, uh, you know, that, that's over there. And so the question is, if you have this, this uh, Earth over there, this Earth-like planet, it looks almost like the Earth or just like it if you want, no problem. But then you have the issue of time. You know, we only have 200 years, really I'm being generous there as well, to be able to send and receive signals to Alpha Centauri uh, takes, you know, at least uh, four and a half years for the signal to go. Assuming they are in the same level as we are, they say, hey, we received a signal. It comes from over there, a planet we call, uh, a star system we call the sun, okay? So they send a signal back, you know? And that would be nine years just to get a round trip, you know, answer. And that's only if, you know, they meet all these extraordinary assumptions. Among them, you know, that the uh, beings over there are in that, uh, are, have developed just like us and are at the same level of intelligence in the same time frame. Okay, so you see, we, we have a lot of coincidences to meet in order to do this. More than likely, you know, we won't find a planet that is similar to the Earth uh, in, in the Centauri system. And certainly, uh, I think the biggest coincidence would be if they develop at the same time as we did, more or less at the same time, so that they have the technology to receive, but we have the same technology to send and vice versa. You know, for that to happen, <laughs> believe me, that's a big, big coincidence. And so if you look at these uh, parameters, uh, I think, uh, you know, the chances of there being another planet uh, with uh, intelligence to the degree that humans have somewhere, I don't know, 20, 100 light years in, in the vicinity, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it would be a miracle if it happened. And that's one issue. And then the other one is because we're talking about Fermi's paradox, you know, why haven't they come here? Okay is that, you know, is it possible for life to travel interstellarly? And the answer here is no. It's impossible for any type of life. In fact, to be able to travel, you can't be a whale, you can't be a bird, you can't be a, uh, you know, fish or anything like that, uh, you know, a four-legged animal that puts all four paws on the, on the ground. It's got to be a, a monkey, okay? It's got to be like us, okay? In fact, uh, I go one step further and say that if we could go to another planet that has human level intelligence, the beings look like us. They don't look, they, they don't, they're not green. They don't have little antennas, you know, they don't look like the Klingons. They look like us. Maybe they're a little darker, a little lighter, maybe a little shorter, a little taller, but uh, they look more or less like us. It, uh, we are the prototype for intelligence of our level. That's one issue. And the other one is that we are the highest level of intelligence in the universe. There can be no higher intelligence than what we are, humans, what hu humans are. Uh, if, <laughs> if, uh, if you don't think that's true, well, maybe you should you know, sue your mother. Maybe you're not intelligent enough. Maybe that's your problem but we are the highest level of intelligence available in the entire universe. There can be no higher intelligence than humans. If you take, um, if, if God came down and sat down next to us and told us how this universe works, we would understand what God is telling us, okay? There is no way that you can think that 
we cannot understand how this universe works. Okay? We would if God told us. Okay? Believe me. We have the highest level of intelligence available. And I don't know what people expect from Mother Nature. Do you, is, what is this super intelligence that they're expecting? That's Hollywood stuff. You know, intelligence of our level, we developed at the highest level. We can think about anything we want. Okay? We can imagine anything we want. Okay? So uh, not only does intelligence walk on two legs and descends from the trees, but it, we have the highest level of intelligence possible in the universe. Okay? Now, what's the issue? The issue is that uh, you, we it would have to be something like us, you know, some humans like us, to be able to travel interstellarly. Again, uh, whales, fish, none of them, uh, birds, you know, uh, lions, they don't think about traveling interstellarly. That's for higher level intelligence like us, the kings of intelligence. Okay? So they, not only would they look like us, but we would be able to build something to travel outside the Earth, which we have, okay? But the question is, can we travel interstellarly? And the issue is no. Here's uh, the, my version versus the mathematical ph ph physicist uh, version of how the universe is built. Mathematical physicists and everybody and their mother for the last 3,000, 4,000 years has proposed Particles. That's what they have proposed. Everybody proposes particles, discrete particles, and they try to do everything with particles. And we're saying there's a different universe. Our universe is a single thread. That's all there is. Okay, single closed loop thread, and uh, this turns into all these interconnected atoms. Again, uh, you see what the rest of the world believes and proposes. You know, they have always proposed that. There's nothing different than what you see there on the left. And we propose that all atoms are physically interconnected. Okay, so uh, once we start with that, uh, you can see that it leads to a different uh, types of theories. Okay, so uh, where does this take us? Well, here's uh, why interstellar travel is not possible. Okay, and uh, if all atoms are physically interconnected across the universe. What we have is um, a bird's beak, which comes out of the sun, and all those ropes that interconnect every atom in the universe, um, you know, they connect us to Alpha Centauri system, for example, if we wanted to travel to, to the Centauri system, right? And you see the bird's beak right there close to the sun, and in between you have this linear regime, okay? And so if our spacecraft tried to leave um, the bird's beak, the more it goes out, the more, the slower it will go. And a lot of people say, well, is that true? I mean, you know, uh, it seems like you got it in reverse, Bill, you know, it should be faster because the sun is pulling. Well, uh, you got to understand the theory, okay? If you're in the linear regime and you're moving along on a constant speed, imagine if you're going towards the sun. Well, as soon as you hit, hit the bird's beak, you're going to be accelerated towards the sun more and more uh, the closer you are to the sun. Okay, so hopefully you understand that, that the closer you are to the sun, you go faster. Meaning that the farther away you go from the sun, the slower you go. The linear regime is a region with no gravity. There's no um, exponential gravity like you feel here on Earth. Okay, and so nothing is pulling on you. That's the issue, okay, from, from the front, from the Centauri system, okay, so, uh, yeah, once, uh, once you start with the uh, hypothesis, the assumption that all atoms are physically interconnected, when you try to leave the uh, solar system, you go through this bird's beak, and at some point, you know, in the distance, right, you go slower and slower and slower because unless you have booster rockets, whatever that pushes you, you know, if you if you just travel at whatever speed you were going, suddenly, you know, you go slower and slower and slower. And at that point, you have no gravity that pulls you outwards. And so you're going to be traveling through this uh, region forever and ever and ever. And, um, you know, you won't make it to the nearest star because you don't have that many lives. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's never going to happen. Uh, that a living entity, which has to be like us, with the intelligence of humans, with the uh, hand, 
eye coordination to build things, you know, intelligently that can travel outside, that that human will make it to the next star. Okay, it's just impossible. And so that's why we haven't had any visitors here from outside the Earth. And a bigger problem is that, you know, we're about to become extinct. And that's what's going to happen to all humans, no matter where they are born, anywhere in the universe. Any planet where humans developed, in other words, our level of intelligence that can build ships and so on, you know, uh, whenever they reach this point where they can develop things, it's because they've already gotten to a point where they're about to become extinct. And so there's the window is very small. There's only a 200 year window to, on the, on the um, gener, generous side, right? A uh, 200 year window in which they can develop this technology and then immediately they die. And so nobody hears about them and nobody's going to hear about us ever. Okay? So yeah, it's a question of space and time. We have, we're, it, uh, it's just too distant to the uh, nearest star. That's one issue. And the other one is that time-wise, uh, whoever develops over there immediately goes extinct, immediately meaning within 200 years, and then another civilization develops over there, and then another one over there, and, and they're all staggered. You know, they're not, they don't occur at the same time. For them to occur at the same time in planets like the Earth, etc., 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 where all the uh, habitable conditions are met, you know, the statistics have to be ridiculous, you know. It just never happened. Uh, maybe a few within the within a galaxy, billions of suns, you know, stars. You know, uh, very few planets probably coincide at the same time, and they're probably not next to each other. One's on the other side of the galaxy, and and so on. So no, we have no way of ever traveling or meeting another civilization that can send a message to us and we can send it back. Never gonna happen, never will.